My name is Elizabeth Watts Pope, and I'm curator of books at the American Antiquarian Society. AAS is an excellent place to study early American printing in its many forms and languages and uses. After all, it was a printer who founded AAS in 1812 in Worcester, Massachusetts, on the land of the Nipmuc people. Isaiah Thomas had just completed the first history of printing in America in 1810, and the printed material he gathered formed the nucleus of the new Learned Society's library. Today, AAS has the best collection in the world of the earliest material printed in what became the United States, encompassing approximately two-thirds of everything printed between 1640 and 1820, for which a copy is known to exist. It wasn't until the early 1800s that new printing technologies would significantly change the printing process. Before that, printing technology had remained much the same since Gutenberg was printing in the 1400s. About 100 years after its European debut, movable metal type was first used for printing in the Americas in 1539 in Mexico City. It wasn't until 100 years later, in 1639, that English immigrants did the first printing in what became the United States on a press owned by Elizabeth Glover. A hundred years after that, presses were being established along the eastern coast of North America into the southern colonies, including the Caribbean. However, there were only about a dozen presses set up in the 1730s. One reason for this slow spread of printing was that colonial and local government strictly controlled printing, keeping production low. The one newspaper that was attempted before 1700, Public Occurrences, was shut down after the very first issue because the printer had not received a license to publish. While the strictest licensing laws lapsed after 1695, local government censorship continued through prosecutions for libel and sedition. Perhaps the most famous example is the 1735 trial of printer John Peter Zenger for seditious libel in criticizing the New York governor. Zenger's acquittal established the principle that if what was written was true, it couldn't be libelous, and numerous London publications took notice as well. Ironically, the same government that could be a printer's worst enemy when prosecuting them for libel could also be their best customer. Government printing contracts were a gold mine. The steady work they provided effectively subsidized the establishment of printing in every colony south of Massachusetts before the revolution. Besides presses being established in new areas, the early 1700s also saw multiple presses set up at the same city. This indicated a greater market for local printing and increased competition. Also for the first time, newspapers and novels began to be printed in the American colonies. In 1704, the Boston Newsletter became the first regularly published newspaper in North America, followed shortly thereafter in 1718 by the weekly Jamaica Current. The first novel printed in America was reprinted from a London edition. Rather than just importing copies of Pamela, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin began printing his own edition in 1742, but it wasn't advertised for sale in his newspaper until 1745. Few colonial printers could risk tying up their type on a new genre like the novel with unproven profitability, and another novel would not be published in the colonies for over 20 years. On the one hand, printed materials kept people in the American colonies connected to European centers of power because a significant portion of their reading material was imported. Also largely being imported from Europe were the presses, type, and paper needed to produce American printing. Yet as presses began to be established all down America's Atlantic coast and inland through the 1700s, the power of mass media was put into American hands. It took the form of newspapers, political broadsides, pamphlets, and more. The flow across the Atlantic was not all one way. A small trickle of books produced in America made their way back across the Atlantic. Some American authors crossed to the prestigious publishing center of London to first get their book published. One example is Phyllis Wheatley, whose book of poems was published in London in 1773. This was the first book published by an African-American woman. In the latter half of the 1700s, the American population greatly increased, as did the number of printers and of presses. Between 1760 and 1790, towns with a press and a local newspaper doubled as printers moved southward and inland. The amount of material printed skyrocketed, 
American Bibliography provides a visual demonstration of this bounty. Its compiler, Evans, attempted to list all the books published in what became the United States through 1801. The first two volumes cover more than 100 years worth of printing, to 1750. But it takes the remaining 11 volumes to cover only half of that time, through 1800. One reason sparking the increased production was the flurry of ideological political pamphlets, as well as newspapers, being published in the decades around the American Revolution. Publishers were taking advantage of the printing press's mass production to connect far-flung areas. Books also began to be marketed as specifically American. Sometimes this new national identity was emph emphasized with Made in America branding. The fact that a book was printed on paper and using type produced in America were touted as selling points. Or the Americanization might be ideological, such as when a 1776 edition of the New England Primer relabeled a woodcut from King George III to become John Hancock, or trolled the king for having lost State 13. However, printing was not just a uniting or revolutionary or a liberating force. Many printers remained loyal to the crown or were ambiguous in their loyalties. New York printer James Rivington very publicly supported the crown, though there is some evidence he later became a spy for George Washington. His newspaper for April 20th, 1775, contains a woodcut depicting him hung in effigy as he had just been in New Jersey. Rivington called for liberty of the press for all parties just before his press was destroyed by the Sons of Liberty. Starting with the first American newspapers, most ran advertisements aimed at returning escaped enslaved people and ads that offered people for sale. As was common with all newspaper ads, interested parties were often directed to call at the printer's office for additional details. In such a way, printers performed a key role perpetuating slavery and even engaged as brokers in the slave trade. It is the social functions of printing, that printing performs in a culture that are most important, and the ways people use printing are not always positive. Where exactly might your average American farmer encounter the increasing volume of books and newspapers and pamphlets that were circulating in the 1700s? The first logical place would be at the printer's office. This also often served as a newspaper office, a post office, a bookshop, a stationery store, and a general information center where readers could find additional details about newspaper ads that printers ran. Many printers were also postmasters, including Benjamin Franklin and Mary Catherine Goddard, the first female postmaster. The postal system was essential to the printing business. Papers were distributed with the mail and discounted rates enabled widespread distribution. Books could also be bought in bookstores established in urban areas like Boston and New York. In addition to importing works from London and elsewhere, booksellers sometimes contracted with local printers to publish works without doing the actual printing themselves. There was even a used book market to recirculate books, which could be bought at auction in a coffee house tavern such as Colonel Brewster's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 18th century readers did not always have to buy what they may have been able to borrow or hear read aloud. Reading was a key activity in sites of 18th century sociability and political discussion, places like taverns and coffee houses and barber shops. Newspapers were passed around, and the news contained therein was debated at the Green Dragon Tavern, for example, where the Sons of Liberty, including Paul Revere, planned the Boston Tea Party. At the nearby King Street Tavern, the 88 books and 31 pamphlets on the barroom bookshelves encouraged patrons to linger even longer. At the barber shop, political cartoons and broadsides might festoon the walls, and newspapers may be scattered about. And of course, one could curl up with a novel to read at home, possibly borrowed from one of the new circulating libraries established after Benjamin Franklin founded the first, the Library Company of Philadelphia, in 1731. At the beginning of the 1700s, most reading material still came from London, as it would for much of the century. Printing on the American side of the Atlantic was tightly controlled by colonial governments, and the fact that governments continued to work so assiduously to control the press is one of the strongest indicators of its power.
the power of the press was concentrated in the hands of a few printers in a handful of northeastern cities. By the beginning of the 1800s, especially after 1820, American print culture would explode in its largest transformation to date. The first U.S. copyright law passed in 1790, and many more would follow after. Printers would begin organizing unions and professional trade groups. Mechanical innovations, like machine-made paper, iron and machine-powered presses, and stereotyping, to name just a few, would mechanize much of the practice of printing. The changes over the 1700s were largely cultural rather than technological. Even the increasing production of American-made paper and type, and eventually printing presses, was spurred on by the political break with Britain, who had been the major supplier. Throughout the 1700s, Americans were figuring out how they would use the printing press as part of the process of forging their nation in the context of a much wider world.